Alright, we are live. Hello everyone, and welcome to today's live stream, where I'm going to be going over the split to instances node, but adding the uh, instance cell origin points, using a technique that Arendale uh, recently showcased in their latest tutorial. So, with the split to instances node, for those of you who don't know, basically it takes an object if it has a ton of disconnected pieces, like this fractured cube, and it will take those separated pieces or whatever index you have. In this case, I'll be using the mesh index, and it will turn it into separate instances, which can be extremely useful. But there's a little problem. The problem being that these split instances do not have a location output for their origin point, which let's just go and demonstrate that. So this will be mesh island index right here. So afterwards, if we were to go and rotate these instances, we will see that they're all rotating at the exact same center point, which is not great. We want this pivot point to be actually where the instance origin is. So unfortunately, uh, there was no implementation of that currently, so we have to do it manually with a workaround. Hopefully in the future, uh, they will add it. But for now, workarounds are what we have to do. So again, Arendelle showcased this in their latest tutorial. I would highly recommend watching that if you want to get a more in-depth, in my bad, um, in-depth example of the effect. Okay, so what we need to do is first uh, get the location data, or first we need to get the bounding box. So what this does is it takes the cells and then it gives the bounding box for each one, for each instance. This is something that I haven't really gone into too deeply, like how the nodes handle when there are instances instead of just one object, but I need to research that quite a bit more because there's a, a good amount of stuff that you can do with it. So you'll see that there's the min and max bounds here. Unfortunately, these do nothing because this bounding box node acts as if the entire object is doing it. It's weird. But these ones, we can see, do not output a field, just a sing singular value that's just 0, 0, which is not useful whatsoever. So we need to extract that data manually per instance. Fortunately, we can use the um, evaluate at index node to get the position at the vertices. So position 1, let's see if we take a look at this one on the, uh, yeah, point should be fine. Here we can see the location data of the instance or the cube at one point. Actually, wait, am I doing this right? Yeah, yeah, I am. So that's that one, and then seven, this is the min, and then seven will be the max of the cube. And we can see the colors reflect uh, that. So let's go and store this data. So let's just go and set this to be zero. And then we need to capture this for later. So we want this to be a vector on the point domain. Go and collapse that. So we want the min and the max. So let's put that to seven and bring this over to here. So we have both of those stored. Now, how do we transfer that back onto the instance domains? Well, we need to do another hack, which Arendelle, once again, uh, showcased this in their tutorial, where you have to basically make sure that the indices are the same. So we have to Basically make it so that there's one point per bounding box so that that'll match the one point per instance so that they can match so that we can then transfer the data. So let's go and do that. So let's just delete geometry and you could just make it so that the index is the input. This will make it so that when the index is zero, nothing will happen, but anything above that, uh, it will delete it. But that's a little... It could be a little confusing for people who don't know about the conversions, so I'll just put a greater than one, or greater than zero will be deleted. Same thing. So we have both of those, and actually I should expand these so that we can clearly see it's on the point domain. So we capture this beforehand, and then uh, we, let's see, is it just me I can't see anything? Um, on my stream preview, I can see the node, so everything should be good. It might be uh, a problem with your setup, unfortunately. Okay, so now that we have this, we need to store the attribute on the instance domain on the actual instances. So let me put two of these here. I'll make them named attributes just for convenience. So this will be min, and this will be max. So let's do that. 
So now that we have the data here with the bounding box all on one point, we can simply sample an index, sample index, which has this data and then easily transfer it again because the indices match. A technique that I need to do more often because apparently like I could probably use convex hull and then get a similar result or we'll see. There's a lot of stuff that possibly can happen with this technique, but I need to look into it a little bit further. So now we have the min and the max and they should be transferred. Just double checking. Yes, that should be good. So now to check if this is actually working. So this is uh, bounds per instance. Go. There we go. Let's just do that and that, which should be good. There we go. So now to check if this is actually working, we can go and feed in uh, the min and the max into the pivot point, but we need to mix between. Actually, no, let's just check the max. Here we should see it is working. Okay, it's not working. What did I do wrong? I think I did it correctly. Point, 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 point over to there. Yeah. Oh, wait, I forgot to realize. Okay, one thing I forgot. Realize the instances after the delete geometry. Very important. There we go. So that makes it so that instead of it operating per point, like with the delete node, it now makes it so that everything's real, so that you can then transfer it in the indices match because this is real geometry, real points, and then these are instances which are just fancy points in a way. So now that we have this, we should see that these are now rotating at the max, which is nice. But if we want this to work with the min and the max, we need to mix between the two so that we get the midpoint. There we go. So we should see, yep, that's rotating right there. So now, um, yeah, now we could do whatever we want with it, which this will pair very well when we eventually are able to make uh, a cell fracture node inside of a geometry node that's performance because right now there are ways to make it but they are the laggiest thing in the known universe but now we have that so that we have the pivot point i guess i could just store the pivot point here and then call it a day but having the bounding box info can be useful in other ways actually no i'm just going to store this as uh origin yeah, origin. So that we can use this later on. So another thing that can come up when I was testing this a little while ago is that if the instances, like if you're referencing a collection, the instance locations could be different by default because that's how it usually works. So you may have to set the... Actually, wait. I should probably go and to showcase this. So in another collection, let's have a few cubes out here in different positions, and then let's go and copy this object, duplicate that, and hide the original. There we go. So instead of doing this on the split to instances, I'm just going to reference this collection. I need to make sure that this works. So we're going to separate the children and see if the rotations are working. Ah, good, they are. So now, um, I guess what I wanted to do is to set the position to make sure to reposition all these instances to zero, zero, which usually you would just use the reset children button right here. But you know, that's not really, you know, let's do it in the fancy way. So if we mix between these two, scale it by negative one and set it to the offset, we'll see that this does not work because their origin points are, wait, hello. Okay, that's working and that's, I'm a little confused as to why that's not doing that. There we go. We're doing that and they're reset to there, but then again, you could just do a vector zero. Let's see, but I think what I wanted to do originally was to, oh right, make it so that the bounding boxes are centered, the min or the max at one, 
so that maybe you can stack these later on. So, like, this is what I wanted, okay. So here, if the objects are different sizes, so here, if they're like this, we'll see that no matter what shape they are, they will be oriented correctly. So there, and there, and then we'll make a big cube. So now, these, in theory, can be stacked with the Accumulate Fields node, I believe, but I don't quite remember how to do that. Oh well, let's try. That's the Accumulate Field. I made a tutorial on this a long time ago when it was first uh, created, but I am somewhat forgetting. So I think we need to subtract that to get the actual dimensions, and then I may need to multiply that times two. Then I may need to subtract the leading by the trailing and then put that into there. Let's see, and this needs to be on the instance domain. Uh, something's happening, but I am really forgetting how to actually do this. Part of it's working. Like, those are stacking, but that's because those are both one. Uh, I have forgotten, which is very unfortunate. Oh well, I'll need to go and look back at that uh, in the future. But yeah, there we go. So, in theory, you can stack these and it should work pretty well if you know what you're doing. Which I do not just yet. It's been a while since I've done that. Let's see, so that's how you would do it. Uh, it could save you in a pinch. But again, a big workaround for something that hopefully in the future will just be a part of the split to instances node, or better yet, the bounding box node just works with instances, because as we can see here, even though there are instances here, it's outputting nothing, which seems more like just kind of more like a bug, because these bounds work, and these are still instances. While here, it just doesn't output the data for some weird reason. So it's good that there's a workaround that we discovered, that Arendelle discovered. But it's unfortunate that we have to do that. But anyway, so that's that. And uh, yeah, I do not really have too much of a plan after this. But I guess we could just go and play around with the this. So, I can see a lot of cases where this will be useful. Like, when you're procedurally generating stuff, being able to split it after the fact and have the origins and bounding box data can be very useful. But I want to see what we can do to push it even further. Because it's not only the bounding box data that we can do, we can use the convex hull. And it should work in a similar manner where this is happening per object. And I think because all of these are already convex, it doesn't mean anything. But, that means, let me think about this for a bit. It would give us like a lower, the lowest poly version of the object that could be used for collisions later on. So we could just switch out that with that, but we won't get like the, we won't get the correct like average points with the convex hull. So how would we do that? Well, I think we can use that uh, accumulate field node and actually use it in the way that I know, that I remember. Okay, so let's make another copy of this node group and see if we can get that part functioning. So duplicate it again by the old version, and then let's go and just delete this. Then use the convex hull, just so that we can get the accurate version, and then Let's see, accumulate field. Actually, wait, I should undo this and just keep what we have. So this should be good. We just need to store the data that we want. So I can delete that and that because I only want the origin points. So that should work. And then this will just be origin. There we go. Bring it over to here. This should work. I haven't tested this, but it should. 
go and bring this. So this will be uh, origin point. There we go. So this is just uh, origin per instance. There we go. So if we use the accumulate field, this should work per instance with all that. Now I want the convex full. Oops, misspelled it. Convex. There we go. Let's bring it over to here. Delete the bounding box. So now we can do a vector. So we need one for the position data and then one for just the amount of vertices, which we could do with an integer set to one. So this should work. This will be like the attribute statistic sum and mean, I guess, but working on a per instance basis. So actually, I should check. I should make sure that's working before. Yep, it's work. Oh, very good. Very, very good. So that stacks up all of the positions, and then we can use vector math. And that should just work. I forget if I need to add or subtract one here, but it should be fine. We'll see. There we go. Now with that, we should get the origin points of the convex hull, which seems to be working. So if you don't want to do the bounding box, you can use the convex hull. I really should have been using the uh, delete geometry per instance, or delete everything except the first point. I, I should have been doing that for a long time, and I'm surprised that I haven't. But again, special thanks to Arendelle for showcasing this technique. All right. Here we go. Are you in uni doing this stuff? Uh, no, I did not go to college at the... I graduated in 2020, which, as you could imagine, uh, was not the best time to graduate. <laughs> but I kind of went straight into the... Um, straight into freelance and then working in, I let's see, 2021, I would say. And then it's just gone well from there. So no, I, I do this as a job, not in uni, unfortunately. Would be fun, though. Would be fun. Let's see. Well, so I know I was planning on going to, looking into going to college, but then I got uh, a very good job that, uh, well, some of you probably already know of, given my recent posts. But yeah. Um, okay, so what else could I do with this? Like, in theory, I could also... Hmm. What other data could I get? Because I could get a fair bit of data. Like, I could store the mass per... Like, an estimate of the mass per cell. Like, the end goal that I want to do with all this is to make rigid body physics with an arbitrary amount of objects because instances and stuff like that. But I'm not sure I know how I would do that because this technique could be extremely useful. And I think it will, it, it could lead to that. Like we have the pivot point of the convex hole, which is really, really good. Just not having to realize the instances makes this a ton faster. And we don't need to, well, simulate a 4-H loop with a repeat zone. Let's see, but what else can be done with this? So again, all of this is just geometry. Uh, again, well, the cells are split. I used the cell fracture add-on, I kind of cheated, but then I joined it all together as if uh, Geometry Nodes was able to split all of that in a timely fashion. Because as we know, it can't. At least, not yet. Maybe, well, that, people have been working on a bisect node, but unfortunately, like, it's been in the works for like over a year at this point, and I'm not sure if uh, the people working on it have time to actually complete it. But hopefully, eventually, we'll get it. Would be nice in 4.2, but we'll see. People have made their own bisect nodes just out of uh, desperation, and I've seen the setups, and they are very complex. 
but I applaud all the people who are able to handle uh, that many indices and edge cases, because it's, uh, it's complex. Okay, so if I want to make this into a rigid body simulation, or in a sense where the, the convex holes are accurate, but it can detect a collision between all of it, how would that work? Because I would assume that you would realize the geometry, and then each part sees if it's intersecting with another object, which that I don't think we can do yet. Like if I stored every single vertice on the instance domain, then then I think we maybe can do that. Just take the instances, see where the geometry is, and it already knows its own bound, so it could shift to wherever it wants. I don't think so. Like, it feels almost possible. Almost. And yet not. So, yeah. Hmm. If anyone has any ideas in the, in the future, let me know. Because that would be extremely powerful. And w way ahead of schedule, because, again, it will be years. Like, I think three years minimum before we get uh, native simulation support in Geonodes. Just because we're lacking quite a bit of uh, external data and storage loops and other stuff. But if we can hack it together, that means that, you know, in theory, geometry nodes could be very powerful. In that regard because I've already and maybe I'll showcase this actually one second I will showcase this in the past let me save this as just a test um, okay let's open up the rigid body physics system which I believe I put in my sim projects file rigid body physics nope that is in 2023 projects there we go so this right here, let me turn this back on, is a rigid body, a rigid body physics system. So here, as we can see, while well, this was a test with getting particles to interact with it, which is very funny, I didn't expect this to work because this is a very hacky setup. But we have a string moving the rigid body physics object and then particles uh, hitting it, which by the way, again, this is not an accurate rigid body system. It's a, uh, it, it still has a lot of bugs, which technically that's not, well, eh, kind of a bug. But yeah, you can just move all that around and then it'll work. No uh, friction, unfortunately, but this does what regular rigid body physics in Blender can no longer do after 2.8, which is having an object that is dynamically moving and having that affect the rigid body scene. Because right now, there, since Blender 2.8, there's been a dependency graph change, which basically means that if the object is updating its position, even if you have the rigid body settings to deform, final, all that stuff, it just won't update unless the user manually causes an update by editing a value, either in the modifier tab or somewhere else. And it's really, really weird and annoying and unfortunate, but it's all we have. Also, it's very funny. Uh, right here, this was just a test of the simulate or rigid body state. So you can see that the string is affecting that part, which is really, really cool. Uh, I think I've gone over how this works in the past, but it really needs an update because uh, I made this when I didn't really know too much about all this. But basically, we have an object, we store the velocity and the rotational velocity, all that good stuff. Then I edit the, the rotational velocity, even though it's not really necessary. Like, that, I need to find a better way of doing rotational velocity without just having the axis angle method, because that is not great. And then, uh, I don't know why I do this. Oh wait, no, this applies to the velocity and then I store the old position because somehow that can be useful. Oh, because I recalculate the velocity after the fact by taking the current position and the old position and then, yeah, okay. So, the way I'm doing this is I'm applying the offsets as if there was no collision 
doing the collision steps, and then resolving the velocity after the fact. And even the rotational velocity, but this is super broken. Don't pay. Well, it's it's very broken. Like it works, but it's hacky and it's not great. But that's that. Uh, but the rigid body collision. This needs work because one, I didn't know the technique about getting the bounds and all that. But actually, I think in this case, yeah, I realized the instances which in this case there's only one it only supports one and then it does all that but in theory i don't need to realize the instance what happens if i why do i join the geometry oh no wait that's for the the line i think i'm not sure Anyway, does that work? Nope. Okay, so realizing it is necessary, at least for this setup. So these are the strings. Ignore that if you don't want that, but this is just the collision check. Again, checking the normals to see if it's inside the ground object. And then uh, I take the velocity, scale it. I'm not entirely sure why. I forgot a good amount of this. But then uh, I scale by 0.5 because that's why I found works the best, moving it half the distance to where it's supposed to be. And then I average those values, and then I translate the instance based off that, and then the rotation is a big pain. And there's better ways of doing this, but I find the center point, which we can find in a much better way now. And then we take the offsets with the collision and then we turn that into a rotation with the cross product for the axis and then the arco sign for the distance radian distance between the axes and then we put that there ignore that that doesn't work um a lot of stuff needs to be done then this the live instance just makes sure that the object is currently live which means that it can deform and all that good stuff and it also stores Oh, right, because setting the rotation is a little bit... Yeah, no, this just makes the instance the current one, because when you put an instance into the simulation zone, it's kind of weird. So if I didn't do that, it would look like this. But with the live instance, we can see that it's actually working. And then I just make draw a line from there to there. So that's a brief overview of that. Still not great, as you can clearly see. I'm still not sure why a majority... It's been a while since I've looked at it. And the one part... This is an experimental one, so it is messier. But... Yeah. Working on stuff. And... Yeah. Like, another thing that me and other people have been working on is trying to get proper, again, rotational physics using inertia tensors. But that has been uh, very difficult to do. That and, yeah, a lot of stuff. I do want to try in other projects that I've really been wanting to uh, fix up is the hair physics, which I really want to do, but I don't, I still feel like I can't quite do it right. Like, I, that needs, again, rotational physics, which still is very difficult to do. But I will figure it out. Like, in theory, it's just like, okay, Use the axis angle, wobble both of them, but it doesn't feel right to wobble the axis as a position because it, that just doesn't make sense. But maybe it does, but we'll see. We'll see, I'll do some more testing. But if we can do this, then Blendini might actually be feasible. Some of the uh, Blender developers were, uh, well, Pablo mentioned Blendini. And uh, it would be cool if we ever got to that point, but it will be years until native support, like without having to do 500 workarounds like we do right now. It'll be a long time before we can do that. All right. And also, since we don't have GPU simulation, uh, all this will be rather slow. Multi-threaded, probably, but slow. Let's see. Forgot to set up that using a dynamic paint to change the rigid bodies. I used 
it used to work and now it doesn't. Yep, and unfortunately due to those dependency changes, I, I haven't heard a lot about the dynamic paint part. But um, yeah, ever since 2.8, all those parts have been at the ends of their lives, so there will be probably no updates, as I've seen in the uh, bug review chats. So the only hope is geometry nodes, and that hope is very far away. So yeah. So here's to hoping. Let's see. Nice content you got there. Ah, thank you. This is, again, just R&D stuff, nothing too special. But hopefully one day it could be good, because the, the goal is just to have one node that is just rigid body physics with all the settings that you want. You just pop it in, and you don't need to worry about it. Again, the end goal of geometry nodes is that you make a node, and you never have to look inside of it again. Which, that's, again, that's the goal. Eventually. Um, yeah. I don't know what else to stream at this part, but maybe I could try out rotational physics. Maybe. Maybe. Let's see. I have a theory on how to speed rendering. If we capture a viewport per frame, then we can render it at... Screenshot per frame. Oh, Oh, that's funny. Wait, screenshot... So, screen recording the rendering instead of rendering with actually rendering? That's an interesting thing that I haven't heard before. But, um... I, I would recommend just rendering. Like, well... <laughs> unless you want very horrendous compression, I guess you could. Because right now, like... I guess if I just turned off all the UI and maximized everything, then yeah, that's really, really fast rendering. But there's a reason why we render with samples. It's because, well, the default renders look a little splotchy. With, with, given regular EV is pretty noiseless by default, even in real time, like most of the time, like here there's a little bit of splotchiness, but EV next, that thing is extremely splotchy by default, and I'm worried that that will not be fixed when it gets released if well if when we'll see but yeah cheers to that day yeah i really hope that uh it, ev or no uh sorry geometry nodes ha is a very good base for a lot of procedural stuff it's very convenient to store and edit attributes that's like one of the greatest strengths and, uh, and again, the integration with the modifier tab and so on. So I hope, I hope that we, uh, that we get to that point. Um, okay. What else? Uh, nope, that was the wrong one. I was trying to find the rigid body physics system. The robot version. Ah, here we go. So this was a test of doing the rigid body simulation. Hello? Ah, there you are. The rigid body simulation on multiple instances at once, which this uses a for each loop to do so. But it's not a real for each loop. It's a hacky and slow and terrible for each loop. But with the the with what Arendale um, showcased. Hacking that to use the convex hole and then possibly getting that data could possibly fix up a lot of this. But right now, it's basically doing this for each instance, which uh, is much slower than it should be. As we can see, we're getting 9 frames per second in something that in a game engine, you could probably do 1,000 of, and it would probably run just fine. But that's probably also because each instance is looking is looking for its collisions again and again and again while in um, a game engine it's probably just evaluating that evaluating that once per frame and then everything just compares between that uh thing not entirely sure i should research that a bit more okay hmm 
Hmm. All right. Hey, I'm new here. Was just wondering, do you do 3D related stuff for work or is it just a hobby? Uh, it's both. Uh, I did it as a hobby for a while. Uh, and then when 2020 hit, I decided to start doing it as a career. I decided to quote unquote, get good and then uh, start doing freelance. And then from that, I got some jobs, one of them being, well, I, I worked on the game Party Animals, which came out, I believe, one year ago, maybe two. And then uh, I also worked on, well, I did quite a few jobs, freelance and not, and then I got employment uh, maybe more than a year ago, which was stable employment. Yeah, two years ago at this point, I think. And then uh, I've also been working on another job, which uh, I'm very excited about, which uh, if you want to see what that is, maybe check my Twitter. But yeah, fun stuff. But yes, I do do this, and not only geometry nodes, obviously. I do a lot of other stuff. But um... Yeah, I do it as a hobby and a job. Yeah. Again, it, it feels like the hobby side has kind of died off with me trying to make this more of a job and then also pushing geometry nodes. Like, in most other programs, having rigid body physics that actually work <laughs> and you can have it work on, you know, objects, dynamic objects in your scene and such, Usually that's implemented by default. Most people just take it for granted. But here in geometry nodes, and again, because the old system is broken currently and it is at the ends of its life, well, all of the simulation parts in here, we're trying to recreate that in geometry nodes because that is the next way. But since we're impatient, we're trying to make it right now, which it really shouldn't be, because it's it. There's no way on earth that it'll be faster than the native implementation, but we will try because uh, it's a challenge, and we love a good challenge. Um. Oh, and by the way, this robot is procedural. Like all all the motion here, it's all physics based, which is very uh fun. Which here, oh. I forgot about that. I still had a regular walker in here. Uh, also... Oh, okay. Let's just do this. So yeah, there's the regular walker. And you can see the wires that control where the legs are going. Oh, and I forgot I did that. That's cool. But yeah, you have that, and then I basically... In this part... Oh, I forgot about that. Oh, that inherits the velocity for the rigid bodies, so that it actually affects the thing. I forgot about that. So essentially, that means if I were to turn off the randomized or the offset like that, then they should just fly. Let me go and exaggerate this. They should just fly. Yeah, where they're actually moving. Huh, cool. Also, uh, why... Oh, did I hide the original one? Why did that not appearing anymore? I'm trying to figure out why the original walker is, uh... Oh, that's why, okay. Have that, and then it explodes. There we go. So here... Yeah, we can see that the actual velocity of all the parts is actually moving everything. I don't think I made the rotational velocity actually work, because I still need to figure that out. It's beautiful. I just wished that uh, it actually worked. And again, no friction, because uh, I still don't know how to correctly implement that. Which I should, because I made the particle system and that has physics and such so i should i should port that into there i watched the new typhlo prism trailer and it reminded me how behind blender is in rich body sims uh blender is very behind in all physics capacities all of them uh even when mantaflow came out uh 
it it has aged pretty quickly. But yeah, all these, and again, these are probably over 10 years old at this point, all of them. So it, well, no, I know all these are over 10 years old because they've existed. Yeah, 10 years ago was 2014. Or actually, wait, I forget. Okay, maybe not 10 years. But, uh... It's unfortunate that these are now decaying because of the dependency graph changes. Or the dependency, dependency graph change and then the update, the fix for it, is still like three years away. That, that's the unfortunate part. Because they've already been broken for four years now, maybe five? When did 2.8 come out? 2019 or 2020? But... Yeah, it's unfortunate, but it'll still be quite a bit longer before we have better implementation. And there are add-ons that do better simulations, like with smoke and such. But um, I'm not sure about rigid body physics, if there's a better way of doing that. But hopefully, when the new version comes, it'll come with uh, GPU acceleration, and all that good stuff, because it would be nice to have real-time uh, fluid simulations. Which the Blender devs have stated. Or... Pablo has stated. That the new... or I forgot who said. The new volume nodes that were supposed to be in 4.1 but got delayed... Uh, are supposed to be the building blocks for fluid simulations and smoke simulations. Which... I hope... That becomes a thing? But uh, I think it'll be a while, and then when it does come out, at least in the first implementation, it will be completely CPU bound, which uh, means that it will be, you know, as slow as the old ones, but customizable, which means that uh, Mantaflow shenanigans we can get around and actually implement particles, like the wake particles, uh, by ourselves, which could be cool. But it'll be uh, quite a while before that happens. All right. Um, other than that, any questions? Because I am out of live stream content at the moment. Let's see. Okay. So let's see what other things I can open that need work. Oh, I was working on this yesterday. But uh, I'll be posting this tomorrow. And it is the ground fracture, which I made this a quite a while ago. Where the ground fractures and then all this happens, you know, the trees wobbling and all that. Which, I believe, yeah, the video should still be up on how I kind of made it and such. But I just updated it with actual assets, like actual free assets, the ground and such. So it looks a bit better. So I'm hoping one day I can really flush this out if I had time. But for the moment, it's it's okay. How was your experience with getting freelance gigs at the beginning? Uh, it was good. I had a pretty good social media following. So, people would usually come to me for their freelance gigs. Which, i that's a very different thing than what most people do. But since I had that following, uh, people usually came to me rather than me going to them. Which is not the standard experience from what I've heard from other people. But that, it went well. Uh, I would just, yeah, and at that time, I did not have to support myself financially. So... It did make a good amount of money, not enough to survive if you're having to sp support yourself financially, but it did work. Uh, but I would recommend, if you're looking to get into 3D work, try to find stable employment, salary-based, because then you just don't have to worry about finances. Because with freelance, you have to wonder, oh, am I going to make rent for the month, and so on. And then trying to get job, well, trying to get gigs and such. But with actual stable employment, 
uh, it you don't have to worry about it. So I would recommend that. Freelance is very good starting out. It'll teach you how to deal uh, with client requests because working professionally, it's the workflow is pretty similar. Just reliable employment is oh you have the same client for a long time if that makes sense. It's similar, and you, the people in the industry know what to expect because they hired you to do a certain thing, and you do that thing. While with freelance, the people who hire you sometimes don't know the limits of like the 3D software and what you can do, what your special well, what your special specialty, sorry, what your specialty is, which uh, at some points. They can request, oh, could you add, like, this fancy thing in the background? And you're like, uh, unfortunately, no. And that kind of feels bad, because it's like, oh, I should be able to make this entire scene. Freelance, with freelance, a lot, you have to be the entire pipeline, most of the time. If someone's like, hey, I want this scene, you have to texture it, render it, uh, put in all the sims, if there are sims, and all that. But, with, uh working in a company or something like that, you are a part of the company. You are a part of the workflow. You don't have to do everything, which is really takes the stress off. Because they hired you to do a thing, and you do that thing. And if you do that thing well, it's good. So, freelance, I would recommend it. Just make sure that uh, you pick your clients well, that they know what you're, capa what you're capable of, uh, and in what time frame. And also, uh, make sure that, uh, you get paid well for, for your time. Because with freelance, again, you don't only... You need to take into account that the time you spend doing your business isn't only when creating the content. Like, you need to charge for the time that you spend searching for jobs. Well, no, not charge the clients. But over like the span of a month, you have to be like, okay, how much time did I spend searching for clients and getting the work versus actually doing the work? And then factor that into how much should I charge per hour when actually doing the work? And there, there, there's a lot of stuff to deal with when um, doing freelance, a lot to think about, which can be a little bit stressful at times. Well, in regular employment, a lot of that is handled for you, in a sense. In a sense. But yeah, I still do freelance every now and then if someone that I know needs uh, help with certain stuff. And uh, yeah, it's still good. Yeah, that's super good insight. Thanks a lot, pal. Hey, I'm happy I could give some advice. I do work at a studio, but the economy is not great, so I'm trying to get some extra cat, uh, some extras. Yeah, um, yeah, like you, at the moment, like I still have employment, but when freelance gigs come around, sometimes I pick them up if it's like, oh, wait, I can treat myself, fun. And sometimes, like, especially with geometry notes, it's a very niche thing that not too many people do. So if people need help with the geometry notes task, there's only a handful of people that can do it to the level I can. So... It's good to help out when uh, when people need your very very niche skills, which I guess that's a good a good thing. Like if you pick a very niche thing to be skilled at, that means that when people need someone to do it, it's usually you. Like well, the competitiveness is a lot less because uh, there's less people in it. Like GeoNodes, they're at the moment, as we've seen even in this live stream. There are a lot of workarounds that need to be done. Uh, but if you can get around those workarounds, like I kind of fell into that. I'm not sure if I were to restart all of my knowledge from scratch, I think I probably would pick Houdini just because it's more powerful. But since I know Geonodes and the environment very well, I can use that to my advantage. Like everything in here is doable in Houdini. Houdini is the best in the business and always will be. Like this cannot do anything with, heck, it can't even get the uh, active camera data outside of the location, rotation, and scale. You just can't get like the FOV, none of that. 
unless you use a driver, but that's hacky and not great, which again is why I'm trying to get that view layer attribute node in, but well, I need more time to study C++. Um, but yeah, that's, that's that. But yeah, what, once geometry nodes is steadily improving and, uh, I hope that we get to the point where, you know, we can make the rigid body physics and all that, the hair simulations ourselves, and that there's less, uh, roadblocks when it comes to that. The biggest one, the biggest roadblock, I would say, in terms of just doing effects and not in terms of like a pipeline is the for each loop probably which the blender dev said it during the blender conference i i heard from other people i wasn't there at the blender conference this year maybe next year or last year maybe this year i'll i'll be there but the for each loop would solve a lot of the problems that people brought up during that and uh it is planned but at the moment there is no development on it there was a mock-up made, but nothing beyond that. Which I think is because when they created geometry nodes originally, they kind of thought that every node would be its own for each loop, like set position is a for each loop and all that. And a lot of the nodes they're updating to make it so that you don't need a for each loop to do stuff. Like the fill curve node used to not have this group ID input. But now that it does, it has a for each... Uh, I'm assuming it's doing a for each loop per curve now, rather than just doing it on all the geometry at once. So they're making it so more nodes are for each loops themselves, but it's still, uh, without an actual for each loop, things are still rather lacking. Is it possible to do motion graphics in C4D, like C4D in Blender? Could you, you, I would say you could, but it won't be as convenient. If you know C4D, then use C4D. But uh, if you know Blender, use Blender. It's just about which one you need. I can't get used to the new Auto Smooth. The new Auto Smooth is better in so many ways. Uh, I've heard, even in my own comments section, uh, people being like that they don't like the new auto smooth like it is a change of pace but it is just better across the board like here you can actually see oh which parts are well actually here let me go and do this so here shade smooth by angle you can actually see now which parts are sharp with that it doesn't update automatically unless you have the modifier so let's go and put in the smooth by angle modifier and now it's actually oh i can actually tell what's happening Auto smooth or smooth by angle is now where it was always supposed to be, which is in the modifier tab. It really should not have been in this part at all. Well, I guess in in some I, I can kind of see what they were going for with having that in there, but it was so unpredictable having auto smooth. It, it was well, it wasn't as reliable as just having a modifier where you can you know you apply it and then this will not change when you move it. Because before, how would you apply auto smooth? You couldn't really. I guess maybe if you exported and imported it, it could apply it. But now it's where it's supposed to be, in the modifier tab, which is very nice. I don't know, it just gives me results different than what I was used to. The results should be exactly the same, from what I've seen in the dev chats, I think they said that, that it's supposed to be the same. Uh, I mean, there is the ignore sharpness thing, but I think the default value is just, it should be the same. But now it's just a lot more predictable and usable with other workflows. Which I've seen people, add-on creators, that are very, very happy about that change. And also... No, I'm not too sure about that. I've heard that in the... Actually, no, I don't know enough about that. Um, but now it should be faster as well, given that uh, given that the normal calculation inside of Geonodes is faster. So. 
Like, it does seem like I don't remember results like that when I would use auto smooth and then bring it down, so maybe it is doing it per edge, but that is better. I forget back in the day. I don't think it would do that. I think it would be per vertex, or kind of like that. But now it's happening with that, which is actually really cool. So if, if that's what you mean by kind of unexpected results, I, I can see that. Because now it's a bit more specified. But that means it is more accurate. Let me try. Two. Oh, okay. Interesting. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen uh, Auto Smooth do that to a UV sphere before, but that is interesting. Alright, we're coming up on the one hour mark, so I think we can. Uh, wrap it up and also the new modifier tab I know people dislike the new modifier well a few people well a good amount of people dislike the new modifier tab and I do understand that in terms of UI like it's more clicks in order to do stuff but I think well unless you just type like there is just the oh you can just type in subdivision surface and then you get that so well it is more organized, but at the cost of not everything is two clicks away. Now it's kind of like that, and then you have to search for that and that. Or you could just search it normally. So functionally, it is better and more organized. I can see how people don't really like the change all too much. Especially since the constraint thing is still the old one. And I don't think that this one will change anytime soon because, you know, there's not too many where you have to compress it. But yeah. They added the Sheen BSDF node. I thought that was a thing. I thought uh, Sheen BSDF was a thing for a long time. Sheen. Huh. Maybe that's a 4.2 thing. Because I know there's Sheen in other parts, but... Oh, this part. Yeah, there's Sheen in here, but I don't see it as a node. I haven't really used this too much. Only in testing. But yeah, um, that is what is happening in Blender this week. Uh, I'm looking forward to the Google Summer of Code projects, which uh, quite a few people are uh, talking about adding some nodes. There are a few nodes that I'm interested in, like the sound nodes and such. But um, with the sound nodes, the I saw that the original proposal was from March 2023, which means that it's been over a year since then. So I hope it comes around this time. But again, with, uh, you know, don't hold your breath until it's actually inside of uh, the daily builds. And even then, there's a chance that it gets removed, like simulation nodes. But um, yeah. Okay, so thank you all for watching. I hope you've had a fun time. I hope that the um, instance uh, origin point slash bounds data was useful. Thank you very much, Sarandale, for showcasing that. And I hope that I can somehow hack it together to the point where my rigid biophysics system can work with that because I feel like it's possible. But I just need to see what the limits are when the geometry nodes are happening on the instance level because like set position that works on the instance level not on the point level when there are instances so maybe there's a way to work around that but i'm actually not sh well actually wait i need, i i am going to test that right now uh sorry one second everyone so if this is two instance or geometry two instance I'm also kind of... Uh, oh no, that makes sense. So here, and then we have set position. We set this to be random. This will not uh, modify the vertices of this per one. But if we have a stored named attribute node, if we put in the position and connect that to the output, it does work, okay. 
Okay, so that's how you set the position. Again, the stored named attribute node is the best node in geometry nodes. It's just most of the other nodes, but better. I'm, I, I really love it. So the stuff that the regular set position node doesn't do, this can. So, and this can be per instance. So it is superior. And I need to remember if this is true, but I think I saw somewhere that there was the consideration of removing default attributes from attributes that have their own inputs in set position and nodes. Like if there's an input, which is position, and then a node that's set position, I've I do need to verify this, so take this with a grain of salt. I've heard that they might remove those from the store name attribute node, like it being able to see and read it if it pre-exists, like an actual node exists for it. But I think this is a really good argument for not doing that. Because this, again, unless you want to put a domain uh, level, a, a domain enum on all of the nodes that can do this, uh, you know generalized node is better. Now that's good to know. I need to take advantage of that. Again, I haven't done enough with working, like, figuring out how uh, messing with geometry works on a per-instance level, because I could abuse that to make that a kind of for-each loop, because I assume that this works for each instance and is multi-threaded. Okay. think you can apply auto smooth under data geometry data add custom split normal data yeah custom split normal data like that usually shows up when um and i think eventually that this will probably be removed when geometry nodes can set normal data because i think at the moment normals are kind of a weird um, kind of field, like, like it's not an anonymous attribute, I believe they call them. Kind of like how... Actually, I forgot what that was. I guess kind of like how vertex colors were before they changed it. But I think that this will probably be removed sometime in the future, because they do plan on adding custom normal supports in, um, geometry nodes, so you can set the normal. Kind of like how you can set the curve normal. They referenced that when they added in the custom curve normals. So, eventually, we'll get there. This takes a lot of time. Alright, thank you all for watching. I hope you all enjoyed, and I will see you all next time. Have a good one.